So good afternoon, members and friends. Welcome. My name is Lisa Akinyi May. I'm a graduate student at UBC's political science program. In a previous life, I was a journalist, uh, but now I'm a student again, and I'm very honored to be your moderator for today. This event is being hosted by UBC Center for Migration in collaboration with UBC Institute for European Studies. Please feel free to follow us at uh, UBC Migration on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at UBC Migration, and you can also find that on the slide that we are um, showing you right now. Um, feel free to tweet and tag us throughout the talk. Um, before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. The land UBC is situated on has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam people, who for millennia have passed on in their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next. Um, so if you are a settler and you're joining in from somewhere in, 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 in Canada, um, please uh, take a moment to um, reflect on that. Um, before we go on to the talk, I'd like to review the question and answer procedure. Um, please use, use the chat function or raise your hand if you have any questions. And Dr. Hannah Alarian will answer all your questions after her presentation towards the end. If you're not too shy, I will call on you once you've raised your hand to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, but if you're feeling a little bit shy, I will read um, out. Uh, I will read your question out loud. Uh, just make sure that you add it uh, on the chat. And now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hannah Alarian, who is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Florida where she's also a faculty affiliate with the Center for Arts, Migration and Entrepreneurship and Center for European Studies. Dr. Alarian earned her PhD in political science at the University of California, where she was also an affiliate with the Center for the Study of Democracy. Previously, Dr. Alarian was a postdoctoral research associate in Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs. Her research focuses on the comparative politics of belonging, examining topics of migrant integration, political identity, and participation. Her research more broadly um, explores the processes through which immigrants are included in and excluded from their new societies. Her work has been published in top journals like the Comparative Political Studies, German Politics and Society, Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, Journal of Race, Ethnicity and Politics, and presented at multiple political science conferences. Two of her recent publications, um, Dual Citizenship Allowance and Migration Flow, an origin story, and Citizenship in Hard Times, Intra-EU Naturalization and the Euro Crisis, were awarded Quality Research Awards by the School of Social Sciences and the Department of Political Science at the University of California. As you can see, we are very fortunate to have her here today. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Alarian so that she can make the argument that local suffrage increases citizenship acquisition. Dr. Alarian, take it away. Well, thank you so much uh, for that great introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, for having me here today. I'm so excited to be talking with you all about this paper. Uh, it's a work in progress. It's, so it certainly will benefit from your feedback, your thoughts, your comments and uh, critiques as well. Uh, and before I begin, uh, thank you for, uh, to the UBC Center of Migration Studies and Institute for European Studies and also Lisa May for having me here 
And uh, special thanks to all of you for taking time out of your pandemic Monday to be here today virtually. Uh, so although the current title of this paper kind of gives away the ghost about both the topic and the finding a bit, I'd like to take a step back and invite you to um, examine this puzzle that I found, or I, I see it in contemporary democracies globally. Now, it should come to no surprise to everyone here that anti-immigrant rhetoric sentiment and policies uh, globally are both relevant and very salient. Uh, this, you know, in our pre-pandemic world, we saw this in conversations both in voting behavior and uh, the, the downstream international uh, negotiations over Brexit. Uh, but I also wanted to pause and say this is not something that we can leave necessarily behind in our pre-pandemic world, uh, that this is still ongoing and will likely continue on in our post knocking on wood pandemic world. Uh, so just last week, there was a report that came out um, speaking of far right extremism is continuing to increase across Europe, particularly uh, about um, uh, trust and um, perceptions of minorities and immigrants in particular. So although far right parties uh, early on in the pandemic seem to be waning because of their unlikely ability to, uh, to really manage what was going on in the pandemic, it seems that the sentiment still is existing among the public. Uh, and in this photograph that's um, kind of covered up a little bit here, this uh, is uh, at a protest rally in Poland uh, just this last November. Uh, and it's not just uh, the, the public sentiment, but also public policies uh, that, are, that are eager to retrench uh, with respect to citizenship rights. So uh, this, I think, just came out 13 hours ago about um, Danish politicians moving to restrict uh, more citizenship applications. So while we're seeing this kind of uh, negative anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia kind of, uh, increase, and this is not just a unique story to Europe, we see this across uh, democracies globally, but we're also seeing this, uh, to me, potentially puzzling, interesting policy revolution happening, where the rights that were once reserved for citizens are now being extended to non-citizens. So this is a graphical representation of uh, non-citizen voting rights and voting rights broadly defined in this case, uh, just to give us a global snapshot of th these rights are not unique to Europe, but this has been occurring for quite some time. If any of us are Latin Americanists in the room or uh, have some uh, study or history examining Latin America, this should be no surprise whatsoever. But this revolution is still also happening in the context of Europe. So as we, we narrow down now to consider the EU, I wanna talk about non-EU immigrants in particular. This means that uh, non-EU immigrants, they, they do not have the protection of EU citizenship, of EU status, yet at the same time, states are moving to still grant them uh, these types of voting rights. So currently, uh, 15 uh, EU member states allow local voting rights for non-EU citizens. Uh, so that's that lighter blue. Uh, five move to also allow non-EU immigrants to vote in regional or more um, for these types of, of of subnational representative bodies, and two even allow some potential or some uh, non-EU migrants the right to vote in national elections. So uh, on one hand, we have this anti-immigrant sentiment uh, both present within policymakers and uh, citizens, but at the same time, we're, we're seeing that these policies that, that immigrants are getting more rights specifically to political participation in this case. Now you might be asking, okay, what, who cares about local elections? Uh, maybe you don't participate in local elections and maybe they don't really have much salience to your daily life. Um, and if that's the case, then why should we spend the next half hour talking about local voting rights and local suffrage? Well, normatively in the case of, of Europe in particular, local elections are really unique in their ability to shape the political community, representation and public policy. These local elections are especially important uh, in cases where we see uh, devolution, either through federalism, through asymmetric unitary states, or more regionalist states, uh, that these localities become more empowered. And also these local uh, counselors become more visible and, and more impactful to daily, day, daily lives. 
But political elites also looked to local elections for forecasting purposes. They pay so close attention uh, to the outcomes of these elections to use this to, to forecast policy, party preferences, and get a sense of what might be coming up the pike in the future subsequent uh, general elections. But also uh, what I wanna highlight here is that they affect immigrant lives. Um, and this reference is the last two, just to show you that you know, citizens are voting. Uh, it's not something that people just see and okay, fine, on paper, it's important that people are participating. Uh, in local elections. So over half of the states that are referenced here, this is not my figure, I wanna give credit uh, where credit's due here, but also recognize there are non-EU members uh, in Europe on this figure, but still over half have uh, larger than half of their uh, uh, registered public voting in local elections. But the important element here is that local assemblies are increasingly important for immigrant lives. Uh, they're uh, responsible increasingly in Europe, uh, specifically for ensuring uh, immigrant integration. So for example, in Germany, citizenship decisions are largely left up to local interpretations of citizenship law. And um, this leads to court cases and differences in citizenship outcomes uh, by lender, by the federal state. But it's not just a federal thing. Um, so some municipalities in, Netherl in the Netherlands, for example, uh, introduced a school enrollment program and an aim to reach immigrant students but only uh, individuals within those municipalities get the benefit of this uh, additional immigrant outreach. And uh, this kind of uh, sentiment that local politics are crucial for ensuring immigrant integration is shared by the EU, who in 2018 released this large, this evidence of um, this big document describing how local governments are, should be the key focus um, as being stakeholders for immigrant integration and ensuring integration. So immigrants then have a huge stake in what happens in their local elections and their uh, municipal um, governance. So in sum, these local elections are valuable for all involved parties. The, um, the immigrants, the states, and the voters. And there's this strong investment that we would expect such decision-making uh, would have a profound in fact, impact then on the immigrant state relationships. To its credit, the immigration literature and broadly the citizenship literature has examined some of these questions. There's a lot of fantastic literature out there as to why these rights come about, how they expand, how they retrench, uh, and, and what happens with the parties and how they interact with these new individuals within their state. But what we haven't really examined as much um, is this new burgeoning question about the downstream effects and downstream consequences of such rights. And that's what I aim to do in this paper here, uh, asking the larger question, do immigrant voting rights, specifically local voting rights, affect citizenship? By granting local suffrage rights to non-EU citizens, are states providing immigrants the tools and experience to become full citizens? Or are they lowering the demand for naturalization, saying, hold off, you don't need the status. I'll just give you the rights. You don't have to be part of the demos now. And I shouldn't have to explain why citizenship is important here because this is a citizenship uh, conference, uh, speaker series rather, but so we know that this is gonna matter a lot uh, for immigrant receiving societies globally. Now, to answer this question, the first thing I wanted to do was kind of unpack here why different theories about why naturalization might occur. What effect would suffrage have on citizenship? Well, we have to understand and unpack why citizenship occurs in the first place. Now, I'm going to kind of um, outline two broad kind of like logics of citizenship. But I want to clarify that these logics um, are not necessarily one or the other. They can reinforce, they can occur at the same time. And a lot of times the authors I'm going to cite here don't necessarily say, I believe in this is the one logic of, of naturalization. Uh, instead, what I'm hoping to do is just uh, help group the literature to help derive some hypotheses to understand the impact of local suffrage on citizenship might theoretically have. Now, some um, we could consider naturalization and citizenship itself as a resource. In this case, then we would think about this in that Downsian logic, the cost benefits analysis, 
when we detach a benefit of citizenship, then maybe it's unlikely that we would want to go out and get that citizenship ourselves. And we also might want to then consider the ease of acquisition and the strategic global weight of this, um, of this citizenship status when we consider the benefit of, of the status itself. Uh, but I also want us to kind of think about um, this other alternative way to thinking about naturalization itself, which is inclusion. So if we think here about uh, Benedict Anderson's work, that if national identities form when individuals view themselves as part of the community, then we would expect that something like local citizenship or local suffrage, which demonstrates that you are part of the community in some uh, uh, area that we might expect immigrants feel included and therefore want to acquire citizenship at a higher rate. Uh, we also might expect that uh, thinking about citizenship as path dependent or immigrant integration as path dependent, uh, that early experiences of inclusion could beget later experiences of inclusion vis-a-vis -vis citizenship. Uh, and the same thing with political voice, but I want to really just highlight that local suffrage could then act as this normative signal, which would signal to both immigrants, native citizens, and policymakers that this group of migrants are now also included. They are part of us, and therefore, um, just to kind of put this into hypothesis language, under the kind of this resource expectation that when we are awarded, and the, when non-EU immigrants are awarded local suffrage, we would expect a decline in citizenship applications or acquisitions, excuse me. Where if we're thinking about it as an inclusive process, that when uh, we see local suffrage occur, we would also expect to see citizenship acquisitions increase. I wanna pause though and just make a quick caveat to the interpretation of both the theory, the hypotheses and the ensuing results that I'll show in a few moments here. Uh, that naturalization or citizenship acquisition, I'm gonna use both interchangeably right now. Um, it's a two-way street as I'm sure we're all aware that it requires this interest ability from migrants uh, to actually apply and then go through all the entire process but also the interest and approval of the states to have those migrants be um, citizens. Now I'm sure most of us in the room know that citizenship is a really difficult thing to study and this is one of the elements that makes this incredibly difficult, the intractability of untangling these two two-way streets. Uh, so this is something that we should keep in mind uh, as we're interpreting the results. Uh, but there are some alternative explanations that maybe it's not local suffrage but something else going on and we shouldn't just put everything into the participatory element, maybe there's other elements, other rights that we might want to consider. And let's say maybe those are still in the political realm, potentially these larger political representation rights as I'll call them. Uh, so here you could think about uh, a non-EU immigrant participation or ability to participate uh, in civic associations, political parties, or even stand as candidates in these municipal elections. Maybe it's these elements that really matter and not the voting right itself. And I also wanna highlight that these two things these two larger group of things, these political representation rights and local suffrage are not necessarily occurring at the same time, but there are states that uh, take different pathways to political representation. And so here's kind of my traffic light map. I'm um, sorry, there's a lot of maps, but like visible rep uh, representations. Uh, so as we move closer to this bright green color, uh, we're seeing rights that are, are fairly equal uh, between citizens and non-EU immigrants. But there's not a distinguishing line of citizenship to get these rights. Whereas those on the red, um, only citizens have access to these larger political representation rights. Again, civic associations, political parties, and the ability to stand as a candidate. Uh, and in countries where you do not see that X means that they also do have local suffrage. So you can see that there's a lot of countries here. Um, so for example, Germany uh, and France where we're pretty warm towards non-EU immigrants uh, in these representation rights, but don't offer suffrage. As we also see countries that are closer to the, we're gonna keep all of these rep representation rights, but we'll award you from suffrage. So allows us for some variability to assess the differences here. Uh, and then real briefly, I also want to just signal, I'm not gonna go into this in depth um, in the interest of time, but just wanna signal that I'm also thinking about and want to uh, have all of us think about 
uh, citizenship uh, and immigration, not just as what happens once once in the country, but that all of these host of experiences uh, that, that one carries with them. And so that this could also mean that inclusion also means not just inclusion from where they are, but where they came from. And so I'm gonna assess this using dual citizenship and I can talk about this in the um, q and if anyone's curious. Right. So that takes us now to the current empirical design of the study. Uh, so I, I'm gonna analyze this question, does local suffrage affect citizenship? Uh, using two different analyses. The first, I'm gonna zero in in Spain, and the next, gonna broaden this out across the EU to see if this holds representatively. Now, my goal in the next few minutes here is to convince you that we should all be at Spain. <laughs> Spain matters a lot uh, when we're thinking about citizenship uh, and immigration, and also most importantly, in this case, immigrant voting rights. Now, when you think about all of these things, we usually are probably thinking, and some of the literature has talked a lot about Germany, talked a lot about France. Uh, and with that last category, rights, uh, there's been a lot of literature that's on the Nordic states um, to, to looking at the effect of this. And I'm arguing we should be looking at Spain and look, look, let's, hopefully I'll convince you. So um, with respect to immigration, uh, Spain is routinely top five uh, countries who are housing non-EU foreign born. Uh, immigrants. Uh, it, it varies between top three and top five. And I'm not just picking here, so the darker green, the more migrants uh, that a country is housing um, is within its borders. And I'm not just picking on 2016. Uh, this is a trend that occurs throughout. And so as we can watch over time from 2017 to uh, 2020, and I'm sorry, the UK disappeared. We can blame Brexit for that. Um, we see that it's really stable over time, uh, that this is not a one-off. The Spain is routinely uh, one of the top five countries for, for the number of immigrants that uh, is residing. But that means nothing if we're not like comparative with respect to citizenship policies. So let's take a look at that. Um, so comparative access to citizenship, I'm just gonna briefly show, um, some of you may be familiar with MIPEX, uh, the Migrant Integrate Integration Policy Index, they just updated uh, for 2020. I, just to show you the legend before the figure, when you, we see the colors that are closer to the blue, these are countries that have uh, less favorable citizenship policies, so it's more difficult to get citizenship, uh, and countries that are closer to the purple are more favorable, it's easier to get citizenship in these countries. Now the average across the EU is within that uh, light blue range, it's the slightly unfavorable. And Spain's right there with that average. So the modal experience of immigrants trying to acquire citizenship in the EU is close to Spain. Spain's also within that slightly unfavorable category. And so we've got a lot of migrants and they're all ex are generally experiencing the modal comparative uh, citizenship policy. But the most interesting element that makes Spain so important in this case is its relationship to municipal voting rights. <clears throat> Now the Spanish constitution allows non-Spanish nationals to participate within local elections through either an amendment, such as the case with EU citizens in 1992, or through bilateral treaties. But it wasn't until uh, the Spanish Social Workers Party, PSOE, formed its second government in 2008, that the extension of these political rights to non-EU immigrants actually became a reality. Uh, although Norway signed in 19. It remained the only country, non-EU country, until 2009. So um, the, the way that uh, this works is that uh, Spain sent out a reciprocal agreement saying, would you give grants uh, your, or our citizens the right to vote in your local elections and we will do the same. And now and they said that they, their intention was to do this for as many migrants as possible. And there are politicians speaking on the floor uh, arguing instead to do it through amendment to ensure that all non-EU immigrants have the access to the vote. Um, and this is a photo here of the exchange of these notes, the big deal uh, between Spain and the United Kingdom uh, two years ago uh, prior to Brexit. So the UK will now be in the data set. And so I sent it about, uh, Spain sent about approximately 120 country invitations. I say approximately because these numbers vary. It's kind of uncertain. How, how close it is to 120. But, um, and when 
the politicians are talking about this. They're directly invoking discussion about immigrant integration. They're doing it for this purpose. Right. We have to congratulate ourselves. Um, this is a speech on the parliamentary floor because of these rights uh, that is in compliance with the European Charter for the integration of immigrants in the next municipal elections. And this is not a one off. This happens uh, generally almost every time that this, this municipal agreement is spoken about on the parliamentary floor. Uh, here is another uh, speech comment. We understand that this facilitates their integration. Right? This is a big deal. It facilitates immigrant integration. And even in their notes, uh, this is directly invoked, right? So this is an agreement with Argentina, which is still yet to be uh, enacted, but still within here. Uh, the agreement is to contribute, the goal to contribute to better integration and participation of these, uh, of these citizens. Uh, also know that the origin groups are sending the same signal. So this is a signal that's, uh, that everybody is essentially getting. Uh, the Colombian ambassador to Spain uh, said that this agreement is a decisive step toward uh, the transition of the status of immigrants to full citizens. So there's this link that's being made. Um, and it's not just being made by citizens, it's highly, highly, or excuse me, by, by politicians. It's highly, highly visible to the non-elites. Uh, members of society, right? So it's every time that these things are signed, there's a new article that's out. Uh, it was a big deal. So this ABC um, a news article screenshot on the left half of your screen, it's always mirrored for me, um, that, uh, you know, we're gonna have 2 million foreigners who'll be able to vote. Uh, in the second here uh, from LPE that uh, we've got uh, this many new Colombians will be able to elect mayors. And it is the first, Right, so it keeps highlighting how many individuals will be able to vote, and that every time these reciprocal agreements are signed, there's a new news article about it. Uh, and just to show you, I'm not cherry picking. These are very reputable news sources uh, within the course of Spain. Uh, they're the uh, the only one that's higher for LPE is uh, Marco, which is sports. Um, so this is reputable news. Uh, and in that last uh, article I showed, you know, this is also the sense that all non-EU immigrants at some point, or the vast majority, are going to have this right for the 2011 election. And um, so here in Spain, according uh, to this data, if all the agreements are signed, it is estimated that 1.3 million foreign residents could vote in the 2011 municipal elections. So that's great, except it doesn't happen. What does end up happening is only some um, agreements are being able to be signed in time for the 2011 election. Still, only few have actually continued to be signed. So those have, that have been signed prior uh, between this 2009, 2010 period, um, there, there have been very few, if any, that have been added on. Um, so South Korea was added on, for example, uh, as you can see here after the, the municipal election. Uh, and I also want to clarify, this is not uh, Spain's, necessarily Spain's fault. Uh, Spain really did have an incentive to get all of these signed. A lot of times these were held up in bureau bureau bureaucratic um, issues on the, the um, origin side. So to summarize, uh, Spain is really important because of its non-EU population. The citizens, uh, citizenship is granted to non-EU migrants commensurate with the, commensurate with the um, larger EU ex immigrant experience. And uh, they have this unique relationship with municipal rights that allows us to assess um, some difference in difference designs. But also, I just want to highlight that the citizenship policy also is fairly interesting. Uh, there are options to receive citizenship between three and four months, and uh, individuals are able to take court action if their uh, application has been in, uh, has not received a decision in more than a year. So this is also allows us to feel more confident about what we're about to see, that these things can happen relatively quickly. I can talk about more of the Spanish citizenship model uh, later if anyone's interested. But now let's talk about the data and, and measurement. So to assess uh, this larger question, again, to remind you, does local citizenship affect, uh, or sorry, local suffrage affect citizenship acquisition? I'm looking at dyadic citizenship. So that's the uh, annual number of citizenship acquisitions of an origin in a given destination. This first case study, that is a destination of Spain only. Uh, and I'm using data from the OECD International Migration Database. Uh, but I also want to say, it's not on the slide, but um, not only am I using this database, but I'm going through census data as well to um, control and make sure that uh, data quality is met. 
Uh, because it's account variable, I have to do a transformation, but I do alternative modeling and I'm happy to talk about all of that stuff, but we can get to the cool stuff. All right, so um, with respect to my independent variable local suffrage, I hand coded and created a new data set um, using national constitutions, electoral codes, legislative acts, court rulings for each immigrant origin in a country of destination across the EU um, and a second uh, analysis. Um, I also uh, uh, cross validated this with global SIT data whenever possible, which with their country reports, which are phenomenal, um, and also media reports, uh, trying to get at the true, um, you know, de facto element here as well. I, and for alternative, these alternative political rights that I'm interested in, uh, I did a rescaling of a MIPAX index, I can talk about that later, and for dual citizenship, use the Mac and my, um, dual global dual citizenship database, which is a phenomenal resource as well. All right, so combining all of this data together, what do I have? I have 392 citizenship acquisitions between 42 non-EU origins without voting rights and seven non-EU origins with voting rights between 2006 and 2015. This is all of the available data that was uh, present at the time of analysis. I didn't cut anything out. I collected everything and merged everything and used everything as much as possible to ensure that uh, data quality concerns were met. So what does this look like? Um, there, these are the seven origins that were eventually electorally included. And these are the one uh, on the right-hand side, the electorally excluded, those who did not receive such rights, although uh, expecting such rights would come about. So to remind us of the larger question, do immigrant voting rights affect, local voting rights affect citizenship? So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you here, um, regardless of modeling strategy, we should assess what do these patterns look like over time? And so the blue line that you'll start to see is the eventually enfranchised origin groups. The black are those who were disenfranchised, uh, did not receive access to the uh, municipal elections in Spain. Uh, and so before any of this happens, before we know that, okay, maybe some origins might get uh, local voting rights, we see these patterns are fairly similar in citizenship acquisitions, uh, total naturalizations over time. But we see this big jump um, in that blue bar, again, blue line, um, the, uh, the enfranchised groups once they get the right to vote, right? And so that first dash line, that's when um, the first uh, reciprocal agreement was signed. That uh, darker red line, that's when registration occurred, uh, began to occur. And that last line is the date of the municipal election, 2011. Okay. Um, I can talk about the, the ending trends. I'll talk more about that when I talk about trajectory balancing. We can talk about the decay. How long does this effect last? And we see the general, the same pattern to right? calculate this looking at averages as opposed to just raw total numbers. But many of you probably looked at that last slide and said, well, hold on, maybe this just has to do with Central and South American origins or this Ibero-American effect, right? Maybe it's about colonialism. So I checked that. I excluded anyone who didn't have that unique relationship with Spain. And there are um, origins who did not get that right to vote, Argentina, for example, Uruguay, um, that were continued to be disenfranchised despite uh, these promises that they would uh, get the right to vote. And we see the same general patterns. But now let's look at some regressions. Let's look at some co-op plots. Um, so here what we'd be looking at, um, so I mean, these are unstandardized beta coefficients, robust standard errors clustered by origin. Um, we wanna be looking at this. The others are the uh, fixed effects and other covariates that I thought might be of interest to us. Um, full models, I, I have full tables if anyone's interested in looking at that later. Uh, we can see the effect of municipal suffrage. We see this positive effect of municipal suffrage on citizenship uh, acquisitions. But this is still correlational. This is not leveraging the difference in difference framework that we, we can use. And so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be looking at this interaction effect. Uh, so this, you know, just in plain language, we're looking at the effect of having the right to vote and being able to vote, right, post-registration, right? So that's what that, um, that interaction effect is telling us. 
So we want to look there and we still see this positive effect of uh, having the right to vote uh, on citizenship acquisitions. But regardless of modeling strategy, there could be a possibility that there were variations between these two groups, right? There's a lot that could be going on that we just don't know. Before 2009, 2010, they already look the different, different right? So uh, to, uh, to account for some of this, uh, what I'm gonna be using is um, trajectory balancing uh, with kernel expansion. It sounds really fancy, it's not, as fancy <laughs> as you would think. Uh, we're leveraging, uh, we, I mean, it's great, it's very powerful. Uh, we're leveraging, and this is kind of in the um, counterfactual kind of uh, framework here. So what we do is we take uh, everything that we had to try to just create a counterfactual, simulate what would happen to these individuals if they never got the right to vote? What would we expect to see? Right. And what's fantastic about this type of methodology is that it also allows us to see the decay. Right. How long does it take until these origin groups start to behave as though they were expected to if they never had that right to vote to begin with? So what you're seeing on your screen right now is this is how close I was able to get uh, to get balance. I didn't achieve perfect balance, right? They would be perfectly aligned, but we got really, really, really close. So I feel fairly confident here uh, prior to the electoral change. Uh, in case you're curious what they were balanced on, we have to um, balance, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, you know, having too much in the model that we're overfitting it. Uh, and so what we end up seeing then, so we're going to look at that dashed blue line is the counterfactual stain. Uh, what would have happened to these origins if they never got that right to vote? And that black bar uh, is, is modeling the citizenship acquisitions that really did happen once they got that right to vote. So we can see, you still see that set, that same change. And this corresponds to an average treatment effect on the treated of uh, over 4,000 approved applications in 2010 alone, more, for over 4,000 more um, than what we would expect if Spain had just continued on in this path. The average um, treatment effect of the untreated is about, is over 2,000. But what's also quite interesting here is that you see it in 2010, we see it in 2011, and it decays in 2012. It starts to disappear. So it suggests to us that uh, this matters. It matters really, but it matters really in a small window of time. So we see that it mattered in Spain, but does it matter elsewhere? Is this just a story of Spain? Uh, is Spain really that unique, or is it something that we can see elsewhere? So I replicate this looking at naturalization patterns across the EU um, using the same methodology, the same, um, the same data sources, merging in new data whenever possible, if it's necessary to get to 8,000, uh, over 8,000 citizenship acquisition dyads. Again, meaning uh, the number of citizenship applications in a given country from a given origin in a year. Uh, this is from 127 non-EU sending states to 14 EU receiving states from 2007 to 2014. Again, all available data at the time of analysis. Uh, to get a global representation of what was included and what was uh, unfortunately unable to be included, uh, there are all of our 127 countries that were included in the 14 destination because who wants to look at all the names? Let's see what it looks like graphically. Um, and of course, we have to include a lot of different control variables to ensure that things that are could in theory relate to this relationship are accounted for. And um, for those of you who are interested, I just wanted to highlight that these are included. Um, majority of these, if not all of these, were also included in the Spain analysis um, whenever possible. Sometimes with the fixed effect, we couldn't include it. Uh, just to remind you of what the non-EU citizen voting right access is in the EU, I wanted to just show so we got a picture again, just as a reminder, uh, 15 allows some portion, not all, but some portion. It gives us some variation. I'm sorry, I don't have another pretty tele plot. I have a regression table, um, but I want to highlight here again our municipal suffrage. And similar to the Spain analysis, we see this positive effect, although again, remember this is correlational. Um, but we don't see, remember our uh, alternative explanation, maybe it's political representation. We don't see that uh, having a significant impact on citizenship application acquisitions. 
Uh, and although in dual citizenship, we see initially uh, this positive effect, this, this varies or doesn't, it's not consistent once we control for all relevant covariates that could affect this relationship. So uh, this, this relationship is, is less, um, we're less confident about. But again, the key takeaway here is that municipal suffrage uh, is, is relevant. So in conclusion, what have we learned? Can non-citizen local suffrage cultivate citizenship? And I find, and I would argue, yeah, we do. Uh, local suffrage appears really powerful, but in this initial awarding period of the rights. Where political participation, uh, these larger political participatory rights don't seem to have as strong of an impact or, or really any. So this conclusion that I'm drawing from this pattern of results, that local suffrage increases naturalization, it directly conflicts with some of these more rational Downsian logics, but more importantly, it conflicts with this populist rhetoric that um, local voting rights creates a land of milk and honey where foreigners have rights, but not duties. So consequently, I would argue that states exercising political exclusion exclusively uh, may subsequently dampen immigrant communities' the interest in naturalization, but also the state uh, signaling and recognition of, of citizens as part of the demos. And so uh, those interested in really facilitating Im immigrant integration via citizenship, they should consider local voting rights as a means to ensure the country is in fact this land of milk and honey where immigrants not only have rights, but also duties and desire and the ability to belong. So at least just some future questions that I have uh, based on this, about how this relates with permanent residence. Really what we're looking at is this difference between permanent residence and citizenship. It'd be really interesting to see how this disentangles when we look at that level instead. Um, and also further disentangling this migrant or state driven Where's the mechanism here, right? Um, I have theories about this, but I really like to get at um, some, some evidence about where, where this is happening and, and how potentially they're relying on one another. Uh, also expanding more on this origin structure and considering uh, as I'm trying to do, uh, thinking about these rejection of citizenship also is, is the exclusionary component uh, complement to the inclusionary one. With that, I want to thank you for your time, but also a special thanks to um, my undergraduate research assistant, Adrian Oak, a uh, special thanks for his translation and research assistance. I'm looking so much forward to all of your questions and uh, thank you so much.